right, I'm doing a series called Stop It. There are things we need to stop in our lives that will help us actually move ahead, help us grow in Christ, things that will help us be more fruitful and more successful in life. And so what we want to deal with right now is, uh, if, if you like, it's called No Pain, No Gain, or Stop uh, or start to embrace the pain. Stop trying to avoid short-term pain for the sake of long-term gain. We often want the easiest route out of a situation instead of embracing what we need to. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Anyone ever been to the headmaster's office for a hiding when you were young? Ever been disciplined by your parents? Go to the room and wait for me. My mother could never smack very hard. So what she did was she would look at us and say, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> I remember once I said to my mom, mom, listen, don't, let's not do this. Rather you punch me. She says, punch you? I said, yes. So she did, she's got long nails. She did this and I said, mom, you're going to catch your finger. She's a blonde. I said, you're going to catch your finger. She said, what must I do? I said, you've got to hide your finger. My mother does it. She hides her finger, punches me, sprains the wrist, tells my dad, and when I got home, my backside looked worse than her wristed, I can assure you. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruits of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. The Message Bible says, at the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely, for it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationships with God. The principle we're going to look at in the shortened time we have now is this. Stop avoiding the short-term pain that would give you long-term gain. All right. You read in the book of Proverbs about certain people who act like sluggards. Proverbs 6 verse 9. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber. A little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a robber. And want like an armed man. Verse 13, uh, chapter 13 verse 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. While the soul of the diligent is deeply supplied. Or richly supplied. Proverbs 21 verse 25. The desire of the sluggard kills him. For his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves. But the righteous gives or invests. And doesn't hold back. Chapter 24 verse 30. I passed by the field of a sluggard. By the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. I saw, I considered it, I looked and I received instruction. Learn from the mistakes of others. Chapter 26, verse 13, the sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, there's a lion in the streets. In other words, there's danger outside. I think I'm staying inside today. As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard on his bed. I love this. The sluggard buries his hands in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. I'm getting this dog, some of you know in a few weeks' time. And so the owner sent me a picture, uh, a video of the dogs. They're having their first solid meal this week. And there's a bowl like this size, because they're Great Danes, you understand? There's a bowl this size, and there's all these puppies eating their first solid meal. And a couple of the dogs are actually so finished from eating, they're lying with their faces in the bowl. And they're sleeping like this, while others are busy eating, and some are just gorged bellies. And I just thought to myself, that is so like some people I know. The slug buried his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. It's very difficult to talk to a sluggard. They always know better. When you read through these scriptures, it's very easy to discern all of a sudden, ah, a sluggard is a lazy person. A lazy person is a couch potato. A person who will not do what needs to be done to get results. They're just lazy slobs. They never want to get forward in life. They never, actually, that's not exactly always what a, sl a lazy person, a, sl a lazy person isn't always inactive. As a matter of fact, 
whether you're a fruitful or an unfruitful person. You can be very active and be very lazy at the same time. In fact, some of the laziest people are very active. They're just doing all the wrong things. You see, the Bible word for a sluggard there in the book of Proverbs is actually, interestingly, the same Hebrew word for the word indolent. So instead of saying the sluggard says, you say the indolent says. And the word indolent can be defined as somebody who wants a life devoid of pain, discomfort, uh, inconvenience, suffering, exertion. In other words, you can be very lazy, or the Bible says you can be a sluggard, and still be very active. In all of your energy and your activity, you're lazy about doing anything uncomfortable. You're lazy about doing things that are going to cramp your style. You're lazy about things that are going to cause pain and discomfort in your life. You want a life devoid of that stuff. Everything must be, I want it all and I want it now. And I don't want to pay a price to get it either. You look at some people in the workforce today. They always want more money. And the reason they want more money is because the cost of living has gone up. But if you look at their input versus output, the Bible itself says a worker should receive worthy his wages are worthy of the amount of effort he puts in, isn't it? You should get paid not only for the hours you spend, which is what we want to be paid for, especially if we do overtime, but actually you should get rewarded for the value you add to something. What value is added to another person's life because of you? So the true definition of a sluggard is someone who avoids pain. And this is an, a universal truth. That successful or fruitful people know that what they want is often going to require a painful, time-limited step. But they don't mind that time-limited step because they want the reward. I.e. the person who decides to spend hours hours per day for two to three to five to seven years studying to get a degree to go and further themselves later on. Those who would work hard physically, those who would work hard on relationships, those who want to build a better body, those who want to do better at sport. They're just people who are saying, I want to put in in the short-term discomfort in order to reap long-term comfort. Everything of value has this rhythm to it. Pain first, pay off later. Look at these two little mommies this morning boasting little children. Those nine months of pregnancy must have been hell for the husband. Sorry, <laughs> for the wife. You just like the husband stands here beaming like, I helped do this. I mean, flipping 15 minutes later, and she carries nine months. But once baby's born, and you hold this precious little jewel out for the world to see, you don't even remember all that it was that's been. And living out this principle is one of the most fundamental reasons why some people get ahead and others don't. Because some people embrace the pain for sh uh, of short-term discomfort for the sake of long-term benefit. Is that right? You see this throughout the Bible. People who avoid the pain just don't get what they want through life. End of story. The principle I'd like us to own this morning is this. I will stop trying to avoid the things I know I need to go through for the sake of the long-term benefit of doing it. Most situations, regardless of whatever you're going through, start the same way. People in similar situations, all of us in this room, we know that it's time to take a step. We know change is necessary. Number two, we're pretty sure about what we need to do in order to get the change. And number three, we all know it's going to involve a level of, or a time of specific time-limited pain or discomfort. But thereafter, some of us choose to do it, and some of us choose not to. Some of us choose to go through it, and some of us say, there's no ways I'm going to do this. And that's the difference between them. The one group know what's needed to be done and do it. The other group also know what's needed to be done. They just don't. Now, I said that it's short-term, time-limited, one-time difficulties we often have to go through. Let me explain that for a moment. The Bible is very clear to us that when we go through discomfort of some kind or, or pain or whatever, it is short-term. It's time-limited because God will never allow us to be tested or tempted beyond what we can bear. 
If there's something we have to go through for our own good, he will carry us through it and it will not be as bad as it ought to have been if he hadn't been there. He will limit, he will cut short the time so that we can go through something that we can actually learn through it. And it's one time because once you've passed that initial test of maturity, you go on to greater tests. You don't have to go back to that one. We in the room, especially those of you who are charismatics, you love to hear that uh, you never fail the tests in the Lord because in the Lord, everything's yes and amen. And it's true. You don't fail the tests. And we also know you get to take them again and again. So if you're someone like me, uh, it has been said that I could battle slightly with the subject of patience. My mother says that I am a walking revelation of the goodness of God. So when I asked her why, she said, because you are so patient now, hence his eyes are this big, you're so patient now compared to what you were like growing up. And if you see me, you don't want to know what I was like years ago. But you have to learn the patience thing. It's a test I still need to pass fully. So how, what has the Lord given me as teaching aids? Three sons, right? I have an 11, an 8, and a 5, and they're all totally different personalities, but they bring me through every day in this gl glorious subject of patience. And I believe one day when I've learned it, I can just move on to the next test, and I won't have to do that. So it's time limited. It's short. It's one time but it's also painful, the steps that have to be taken, because the flesh never enjoys the purpose, the, per the process. Your flesh never enjoys the process of change. But I do want to say this. When you go through a difficult time, the only part of your flesh that doesn't enjoy the process is that part of you not yet conformed to Christ. That part of you that doesn't yet resemble the Lord Jesus is the only part that struggles. The rest of you is fine. Does that make sense? And so it's painful because there needs to be adaption. There has to be pain through the process. This week, I didn't have much time to go and get to CrossFit. So this friend of mine says, oh, listen, he's got a, he goes to a gym right near my house. He says, his brother's supposed to train with him, and his brother's bailed out for a little while. He says, this week, I've paid for the two lessons. Do you want to come with early to the personal trainer with me? I'm telling you today, personal trainers are from the devil. <laughs> Is there any personal trainers in this room today? Okay, there are. One, two, three. Okay, forgive me. There was one in the earlier meeting too, a girl who's stronger than me. She checked me out, flexed a bit, and I'm like, okay, let me look to this side of the, of the room. This way I can, I see you guys are dotted everywhere. There's nowhere for me to look. So I'm just going to talk like this. And so, and I had to go in and do stuff. And they're remorseless, relentless. From the moment you walk in, okay, do that. 15 of those, 25 of those, 18 of those. Come on, stop talking. No, you don't need water. Come on, go. It's like, what is wrong with you? So there's parts of me crying out for salvation. I said things like, I need to, maybe I need to go pray. The Lord, there's a burden on me. No, you pray later. Come on, you got to work. These people, it's relentless. But that part of me that can't cope is that part of me that isn't as it should be. Because they, you get those people in gym. Have you seen those girls? They annoy the life out of me. Their faces are dressed like they're going to Santon. You ever seen them? In their kit, and their hair is perfectly positioned, and every bit of makeup is perfect, and they sweat for an hour. I mean, they work for an hour and no sweat. You think, what do you do? Because they've got themselves to that level of fitness that they can do an hour. When I've done an hour, I swear the Red Sea needs to be reparted. When other people do, I was like, they don't even know, that's dab, 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 and they're ready to go. Because their whole lives, they've just looked after themselves. Don't you hate those people? Because some of us, it's painful to have to go through change. You go and do a hard session of, of, of gym, or you go and do a CrossFit class. Two days later, you can't walk, you can't, you've called the elders to come lay hands on you with oil. Nothing's working. But you've got to realize that sometimes the painful process is necessary to bring you through for long-term gain. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, you might want to open your Bible to there if you have it. If you don't, just look up behind me. But Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let's run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. 
And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you left without discipline in which all have participated, you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? The uh, message Bible puts it like this. You see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way. All these veterans cheering us on. It means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat. No parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. In this all-out match against sin, others have suffered far worse than you. To say nothing of what Jesus went through. All that bloodshed. So don't feel sorry for yourselves. Or have you forgotten how good parents treat children and that, reg and that God regards you as his children? My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. I love this. God is educating you. That's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as dear children. This trouble you're in isn't punishment, it's training. The normal experience of children. Only irresponsible parents leave children to fend for themselves. Would you prefer an irresponsible God? We respect our own parents for training and not spoiling us. Why not embrace God's training so that we can truly live? The other area might be the area of sin, let's say. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one, when he is tempted, say, I'm being tempted by God. For God can't be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when fully grown, brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. The Message Bible puts it like this. Anyone who meets a testing challenge head-on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For such persons, loyally in love with God, the reward is life and more life. Don't let anyone under pressure to give in to evil say, God is trying to trip me up. God is impervious to evil and puts evil in no one's way. The temptation, the temptation to give in to evil comes from us and us only. We've got no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lust. Lust gets pregnant and has a baby, sin. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. So, my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable and perfect gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. Now, compare that to people who don't want to embrace pain. Don't you find that those kind of people are almost allergic to short-term discomfort? Another definition of the word indolent or a sluggard is a medicine causing little or no pain. Don't we all want that? I don't want to go through the pain. Rather give me medicine. I want something to take it away. I think the Rolling Stones got it right. She goes running for the shelter of her mother's. Anyone know the song? Little helper just to get her through the day. I hear every mother say, doctor, please. Some more of these. She took four more outside the door. Some of you know. Shall I carry on? <laughs> what a drag it is getting old. A song called My Mother's Little Helper, Pull Poppers. Don't you find people going through life, trials, it's difficult. I can't handle it. I don't want to face myself and the changes. I run to the doctor. This is what the doctor says. You need a pill. 
Then you need another pull. Then you need pulls for the effects of those pulls, and those pulls help with those pulls. By the end, you take your satchel with you wherever you go. And we all think it's M&Ms and, 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 and Smarties, but actually, this is my morning dose of, because I cannot handle the short-term pain of perhaps having to look myself in the mirror and say, Lord, who am I? Where am I? How am I? Lord, help me through. You see the people, we do marriage courses, pre-marriage courses, right? So you get pre-marriage course, marriage course, and if your marriage didn't work, we do divorce course. Then we have grief share if you killed them. You know in this church, pre-marriage, marriage, post-marriage, divorce care, grief share, parenting, and finances. All courses we run because you need the whole lot the moment you link up with another person. And then I sat with someone a little while ago and I said, I really suggest you do a divorce care. I wanted to get married. I've been married before. I said, they want to do a divorce care. I said, maybe you should do it. They said, no, I've been married. This is the words. I've been married three times. There's nothing you can teach me. To which my response was, I feel sorry for the woman you're marrying, pal. No, I feel sorry for you. But I do feel sorry for the woman that you're about to hit yourself to. You've had three marriages already that didn't work, and you're the expert who can't go. Why? Because I don't want to open up to the fact that I might have to go through some short-term pain, limited, once-off, to learn who I am, that God can come in and heal me and fix me up, that I can be good for other people. It's just a fact. You need to take the painful steps if you want to achieve what God's got for you. Is that okay? There are certain people who believe like, I don't need exercise and good eating, but I want to look good and be good and feel good. You can't. It's one or the other. You can't have them both. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, as Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passion, but for the will of God. The Message Bible says, since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, learn to think like him. Think of your sufferings as a weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. Then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. Isn't that so true? 1 Corinthians 9 says, Don't you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I don't run aimlessly. I don't box like one beating the air. I discipline my body. I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Whether the short-term pain you need to go through is to break a destructive habit in your life, or whether it is simply the decision to do the right thing, to gain for yourself better for later, embrace the short-term suffering. No pain, no gain. Okay, great, great. I want to close this meeting. How? I mean, that's brilliant, but how? I need to walk out here knowing what do I do when I walk out these doors. Thank you for asking. Are you ready? What you do is you go to the book of Romans chapter 8. If you have a Bible, please turn there. I know it's going to come up behind me, but please turn there. I'll tell you why. Because on Monday morning, when you're faced with certain issues, you can't run back to church and ask us to bring the projectionist to set up the screen behind you so you can look. You're going to have to open a Bible and find it for yourself. Romans chapter 8 from verse 14 says this, and I'll close with these words. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Can I help you with that quickly? Then we're done. In the first place, the Bible says those who walk by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. In English, this is what it means. Your life 
has turns and twists and curves coming you know nothing about. You can arrange your life, but I can assure you, surprises are bound to happen. Many of you can say that I never ever thought I would walk through dot, dot, dot. Now the point is the Spirit of God does know. And so the Bible says those who are led by, those who walk with the Spirit of God who knows all things, He will lead you and keep you in step with the will of God for you that no matter where you're walking, you'll be okay. The spirit of slavery doesn't have to rest on you. Slavery to fear. Because that's what people do. We fear the future. It's amazing how many people suddenly became Christians just before the elections. Because we're nervous. We don't know what's going to happen. So suddenly it's God, it's Jesus, it's a bit of everything. Now that the DA has done all right for some, some are rejoicing. Some are like, oh no, they're really... And so some are in church saying yay, some are in church saying nay. But next week they're all out and carrying on with their normal lives again. But the way that we avert the slavery of fear in our lives is we have to learn to walk with the Spirit of God. Now the Bible says that we are children of God if we walk with the Spirit. Children is that Greek word technon, which is like a little child with whom you have intimacy of relationship and fellowship. So in other words, you learn to grow in a relationship with your parent. God is saying those who walk with us, those who are no longer children of slavery, but are children of mine, are those who have learned that I'm a good father, I'm a good God. You see, God by the Spirit is going to lead you along paths you often don't want to go through short-term difficulties that are actually good for you long-term. Some of you mothers know exactly what I'm talking about. You give birth to this little child. This little child becomes a little idol. And this little child goes, she's three years old. And when you were just three years old, means they need to go to play school. But you dare not trust another human being. So you have spent three years learning, and now you become a teacher for preschool kids. And then you look after your little precious, three, four, five. Then you become a primary school teacher. Then you through till they're 13. Then you become a high school teacher. Then you become a university teacher. And then you move in with them when they get married. Because you never want them on their own. Uh, but unfortunately, the day does come where you have to go to a little preschool. And you walk to the little one who has no idea what's coming because you don't prep them. They're three years old. You hold them and they go like this. And they walk in and you give them to some foreigner. And you walk out. And that little child's like, ah, oh, devastation, end of the world, separation anxiety. I need therapy the rest of my life. No one can ever leave me. No, it's called normal life. Never mind mommy leaves the little child and gets back in the car all brave, closes the door, howls like a baby, resets everything. It's a necessary part of growing up. They have to do it at preschool. They have to do it at school. They have to university. Then, then the last time they go down the aisle, and daddy's crying for two reasons. Number one, he's leaving his little daughter. Number two, he knows what this just cost him. He has no bucks anymore. The third part, relief, buddy, this is yours now. You're paying from now on. But whatever it is, there are certain things you have to go through that are very necessary. The day I went into the army, I remember my dad wrote me a letter. And he said, son, if, there was, if it was within my power to go in your place, I would have. But I can't, my boy, this is yours. There are short-term difficulties. So, so the Lord tells us, now listen, learn to walk with the Spirit. Because when you learn to walk with the Spirit, He will draw alongside you. And that's why we do our evening series at the moment called Discovering the Holy Spirit. I'll be preaching about it tonight. We're saying, how do I walk with Him? Because the Bible says there, you didn't receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Listen, you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now that word adoption doesn't mean what we think it does. Little Oliver, remember little Oliver? Please, sir, can I have some more gruel? Remember, all I need is love. It's not Arthur looking for Fagin. I mean, Oliver looking for Fagin. This is that when the Bible talks about adoption or the language of adoption, it means you take a child, you give the child your name, you give the child your identity, you give him your inheritance. It gets pressed upon that child. Adoption means the inferring of a name upon yourself. That's why the Holy Spirit says, you've not been made a slave to fear, hence going through small difficulties where you have to expose yourself. Actually, you've been given the spirit of adoption. When the Spirit of God is within you and upon you, and you've learned to walk closer to God and you trust Him, in a technon child relationship of growing intimacy, you know that your father will never take you to a place where you are tested beyond what you can bear. You know you will always be taken in and through a trial because God is always faithful. 
And in that moment of pressure, in that moment you can't cope. I'm saying goodbye to my child. I have a life-threatening disease. I've lost my job. Whatever it is, I'm battling the spirit in you of adoption. The one that shows you you're an heir with Christ enables you to suddenly call out to God and say, Abba, Father, whenever you're in trouble, Father, it enables you to not give in to the fear, but to call out Father. And I would say to you in this room that there are some of us having to go through things right now. And what you have to learn is that you can trust God that when He takes you through a time of short-term limited pain, it's for your long-term benefit. And you don't have to get stuck here in the place of fear. Well, you go back to destructive patterns and habits to avoid real life. You're able to stand up and say, you know what, as I learn to walk with the Spirit, as I learn that God ministers to me, I stand in the confidence that I'm an heir. I'm a son or a daughter. I'm a child of God. And from my spirit, I can begin to say, Abba. I can begin to call to my Father who brings me through these times. Stand with me, please.